Welcome to this beginning course in thermodynamics. It's a fascinating and a very important subject, which began about 300, 350 years ago, when it was realized that heat is actually another form of energy or work. So when you do work in rubbing your hands, you feel they're getting hot. Well, that's the conversion of mechanical work into heat energy. We'll cover a lot of ground in this course, but the first question is, who needs thermodynamics? And the answer is, it's needed across the board in physics, every field of it, but even more in engineering. So if you are an engineer designing a power plant that produces electricity, you will have to know all the energy ins and outs and the thermodynamic properties of all the processes that are involved. If you're a chemical engineer making fertilizer or pharmaceuticals or whatever, well, you will have to know a lot about what is called free energy. You'll have to know how, how various substances can release heat or absorb heat at various stages. If you're somebody studying the environment and wants to look at ocean currents and or how, they, how the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide, etc., or how glaciers melt, that's thermodynamics there as well. And I could say the same for biochemistry. I could say the same for practically everything on Earth. But even more, black holes. <laughs> the black hole. Would you have ever thought that thermodynamics has got anything to do with this dead star or this, this gravitational anomaly? No, but uh, Stephen Hawking did. And now we have the laws of black hole thermodynamics. Of course, we can't get into that. Or maybe I'll just touch on it at the end. So that's the breadth of thermodynamics. It's, it can be treated in various ways very rigorously, mathematically, and there's a lot of satisfaction to be had from that, but we won't do that. We'll just go step by step and begin with the simplest of ideas. Take a cold body, bring a hot body into contact with it, wait for a while, and both of them will become warm. Put another warm body into contact with them, and nothing will happen. Now, this is telling us that heat flows from a hot body to a cold body. In fact, that is the definition of heat. It goes from hot to cold. Now, here's a sort of definition. Temperature is the degree of hotness as measured by a thermometer. Now, this is just an intuitive definition. We haven't even said what a thermometer is. There are, in fact, different kinds of thermometers, but if those thermometers are made correctly, then they will all agree with each other. If there's disagreement, we must find out why. So here's a definition of heat. It is energy in transit, but then you will ask, what is energy? After all, we must be able to define all the terms that we use. The answer to this is, energy is that thing which causes change to happen. Now, that sounds very vague, but it's not. So, imagine that you push a body, a free body. It's going to increase its kinetic energy. It's going to move faster. So change has happened. In a chemical reaction, change happens. The same for a nuclear reaction. At some point, we will even talk about dark energy, that which makes the universe expand faster and faster. But heat is different from other forms of energy, such as kinetic energy. Heat energy is that which comes from random motions. But then you'll ask, motion of what? Is it Molecules? Is it atoms, photons, neutrinos, what? And the answer is, all of them, 
any of them, if they move randomly, that leads to heat energy. That's what we call heat energy. Here's a definition of thermal equilibrium. When heat stops flowing between bodies in contact, we say that those bodies are in thermal equilibrium. How long it takes for a hot body to communicate its heat to a cold body, thermodynamics has nothing to say about that. It cannot tell you the rate, but it does tell you that when they are in thermal equilibrium, no heat flows from one to the other. And now this brings us to the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Actually, the reason it's called zeroth law is because it is sort of so obvious that if system A is in thermal equilibrium with system B, and if A is also in thermal equilibrium with system C, then B and C have to be in thermal equilibrium with each other. So like up here, you see there are three bodies which are in thermal equilibrium with each other. They're not exchanging heat anymore because they have now come to the same common temperature. The next question that we must confront is how do you measure temperature? And you could rely on some physical property changing such as the expansion of a liquid. So here the temperature is less, the expansion is less. Here with the green it's a bit more and here with the red it's even more. Of course all thermometers have to agree with each other and so those made by one company or by another company or those that use one material or those that use another material they all have to agree, they have to be calibrated. Here's another example of a thermometer and this is an industrial thermometer. It uses metallic expansion instead of the expansion of a liquid. Here's a different kind of thermometer. It uses radiation from a hot body, something that is called the Stefan Boltzmann law that we'll come to later. And here the amount of heat that is radiated from a person's skin is captured by sensors that look at a particular range of frequencies and estimate the temperature of the skin. One of the oldest kinds of thermometers was the constant volume gas thermometer. So there's gas in this and this gas is kept at a fixed volume because there's this reference level that's constant. So there's this column of liquid of height H. As one heats up this gas over here, the pressure increases, that pushes out the gas, exerts a pressure over here, and now that pressure here and the pressure here have to be equal how much is the pressure here? Well, it is the density of the liquid into the acceleration due to gravity times this height h. So as you heat up the gas, this height over here increases. What one finds here is that the pressure increases linearly or almost linearly in the range between zero degrees centigrade and 100 degrees centigrade. So you can see that this line is steadily inching upwards. Now different gases, so this could be let's say nitrogen, this could be oxygen, whatever. So there's one gas over here. As you heat it, you see that the pressure increases. It increases quite a bit over here. For the second gas, there's a smaller increase in pressure and for the third, it's even less. Now if you extrapolate all these lines backward, then they come and meet at one single point and that one single point is known as the absolute zero of temperature. Even though this observation came from gases, yet this holds for every form of matter that there is a smallest temperature.
This is a temperature scale that I'm showing just for a reference. So forget Fahrenheit, only the Americans use that these days. There's centigrade and there's degrees Kelvin. Zero degrees Kelvin, this is absolute zero here. An absolute zero, then as we go up, we see that at 273 point something, that becomes the zero degrees centigrade. Water then boils 100 degrees above that at 373. In physics, we use degrees Kelvin, not degrees centigrade or degrees Fahrenheit. So here is where water freezes. A little above is where it boils. The melting of copper. The surface of the sun, which is something like 5,000 degrees Kelvin. Of course, the corona is much higher in temperature. The inside of the sun is more like 10 million degrees centigrade. A hydrogen bomb is even hotter. It's about 10 times hotter than what's inside the sun. But now let's go the other way. Liquid helium is... Uh, easily available these days. You can buy it for laboratory use. The lowest achieved temperature is something like 10 to the power minus 10 degrees K. And how you make a refrigerator that takes you down so far? Well, you have to rely upon nuclear spins, but then we'll, we might talk about that at some later point. Can you go to absolute zero degrees Kelvin? The answer is no. That is forbidden by the third law of thermodynamics, which says that you can get very, very close to it. So maybe in the future, 10 to the minus 10 will go down to 10 to the minus 11, 10 to the minus 12 or whatever. But the third law tells you that this is something that you can never get to exactly.